What's up, everyone? Welcome to my corner of the internet. I'm your host, Ryan Kramer, and this is Crossover Commerce, presented by Ping Pong Payments, the leading global payments provider helping sellers keep more of their hard-earned money. Hey, what's up, everyone? I'm your host, Ryan Kramer, and welcome to another episode of Crossover Commerce. This is episode 115 of Crossover Commerce. This is my corner of the internet where I bring you the best experts in the Amazon and e commerce industry. So you made it. If you're looking for that, that's where we are right now. We're going to share their, they're going to share their insights. I'll share my insights as well, but they're going to share their insights on the most important aspects of selling online, what you need to be successful how you might in that specific part of what they specialize in. That's why I bring them on board to share those insights for free with you. Um, again, on live, if you're watching this, this is on live on Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn, or Twitter. So you've made it. Uh, we're going to be sharing that all here today. But the question about today was to successfully build Amazon on Amazon and expand your e-commerce business nationally and internationally. It's very important to connect with and surround yourself with like-minded people. And we talked about that a little bit yesterday with our networking and mastermind courses uh, that we talked with Brandon Young about. But today I wanted to get into cover avoid hiring scammers and how to figure out how service provider is a good match. If you're expanding, you want to outsource tasks and have a great investment into your growth of your business. So that's what we're all going to cover today. And so we titled today's episode, of course, don't get scammed. Work with the right e-commerce companies. Very simple, straightforward. So as always, Crossover Commerce is presented by Ping Pong Payments, of course. Ping Pong transfers more than $150 million a day for e-commerce sellers just like you. And if you're around the world and you're selling on different marketplaces, which we'll talk about today, and you're converting money or sending money to different entities like your supplier, manufacturer, or distributor, or just, you know, just wanted to have money in a different currency, go ahead and check out Ping Pong Payments. We've converted over $90 billion in cross-border payments to date, helping e-commerce sellers put more to their bottom line, saving you money, making you more profitable. Who doesn't want that? So go ahead and check out Ping Pong Payments today. Click on that link in the show notes below. Just want to give a big welcome again to everyone watching on social media. Welcome. This is an interactive show. If you have a question that pops up along the way where you just don't know what we're talking about, or if you want to have a specific question, go ahead and put those in and we'll make sure those appear on our screen to answer your questions um, and get that sorted out as well. But go ahead and follow myself and follow our guests on social media as well. Those are in the show notes below. But this show isn't just about me. If it was just Ryan Kramer crossover commerce, we wouldn't make it past season one. So therefore, I have a luxury to have a network of people who know what they're talking about. So brought in the best of the best for people like you guys. Uh, but our guest today, Christina, is the matchmaker and partner at Ceremondo, uh, the largest global directory, directory platform for Amazon services. It's her mission to help Amazon sellers grow their business internationally by connecting with them all around the world. Her passion is creating content that educates sellers and how to successfully establish B2B relationships, interviewing different Amazon experts for the Seller Mundo Talks podcast. Also something we have in common. Seller Mundo is a global service provider platform for Amazon services. It is their mission to help Amazon sellers grow their business internationally by connecting them to the right service providers from all around the world. Uh, they've worked with categories in 20, 20 categories in over 40 countries, all specialized in experience in working with Amazon merchants. Whether you're looking for legal advice, logistics, uh, marketing agencies, or even cross-border payments, check out Ceremundo. We'll have the link to their website here shortly in the show notes below, but welcome to Crossover Commerce. Once again, actually, she was part of the panel, but this is the first time individually uh, Christina Mertens from Ceremono. Christina, welcome to Crossover Commerce again. I'll say welcome back. Hi, Ryan. Thanks for having me. I'm super happy to be here today. Yeah, of course. You're joining us again. You haven't moved since the last time we talked to you, but you're in Germany, correct? Yeah, I'm in the south of Germany in uh, the beautiful city of Munich. Munich. Okay, so yeah. I've been to Frankfurt. I've been to Berlin. Haven't been to Munich, but people might know Munich from, of course, Oktoberfest, correct? And F to buy on München, probably. Yes, that one. <laughs> that I'm just kidding. That that as well. <laughs> if I could speak German, I would know exactly what that is, and I apologize for that. But 
it, it's funny when I talk about Oktoberfest and when I was in college over there, when we were traveling, I was on a train. Uh, we flew into Frankfurt. Half of us went down to Munich. And this is in September because it's very, very confusing. Oktoberfest happens in September. So yeah. fun fact for all you who don't know that. <laughs> um, we They went south and we went north. And they ended up sleeping in camp, uh, tents in fields somewhere. And I think that's a commonality down there for that. I'm not sure. But we went north and we saw like the Berlin Wall. We, we went and traveled and did like, you know, I feel like it, uh, <laughs> more touristy things like uh, see the Berlin Wall and things like that. But it was super cool to see Germany. And that was one of my favorite uh, countries to go to just for cultural reasons. So you've been there your whole life, correct? Yeah. And awesome. if you if you ever have the chance to get to Munich, obviously I will show you around, show you the best restaurants, and also we will do some sightseeing and drinking beer, obviously. Uh, oh, of course. Well, this is the this is the beautiful thing. So I lo I love drinking beer. I mean, this is so off the topic, but what we're talking about. But this is this is a beautiful segue. So it, it's something fascinating with food and culture. Uh, you can just go off a shelf, drink warm beer, and it tastes fantastic. Like here in the United States, if you drink warm beer, it's awful. Like, but in Germany, I was so surprised. I couldn't believe it. I don't know what it is, if it's just because they're used to it or if that's how, how it's supposed to be, but it was awesome. So I'll definitely keep you up there. I should have a list of all the people who've promised to take me around to locations <laughs> once, so once we've had them on. Out of this. <laughs> I said. swear, I think I can make my way around the world and meet up with a bunch of people. So that's the beauty of this. So, uh, yeah, well, again, welcome aboard uh, the show. This is, you were on a uh, round table we had. Uh, I'm going to say back in February. Uh, that yeah. sounds about right, right? Yeah. So what's been new with you, Saramondo, uh, e-commerce, you know, Q1? What's been like for you guys in that regard? Um, nothing really changed that much. Um, the only thing that we have seen uh, growing more than ever in the last few weeks and also months is the whole FBI, uh, FBA acquiring industry there are so many new service providers um popping out of nowhere and we're in steady contact with a few of them trying to vet them and see if we can get any fba acquirers on board at sermondo that's awesome because you're right because there's so many different ones that are popping up out of nowhere i i can't i think there's over 100 where it's either specific um categories that they're featuring in or it's in different, uh, you just in general, like a, a Thrasio, right? So that that's the category you guys are specifically working on and trying to vet. Um, we don't have a specific category, but if there's an acquirer who is specialized in yeah acquiring FBA businesses that already have a certain value, then they are really interesting for us to add to our platform. Absolutely. Well, this is this is strange too because. You're now seeing all this money being thrown around. Even one of our partners here at Ping Pong, they just raised, I want to say, oh, this was like $775 million. It was it was nuts. I think it was uh, Perch. I'm going to quote that. I'm going to incorrectly quote that number, but it was the largest single round in history raising funds. So what for what's going on right now, I'm curious to see, you guys should say you're vetting these companies. And I think that's fascinating to hear that. What do you mean by vetting and kind of maybe bring in ceremony? What what is your guys' focus in that regard? So just in general, every kind of service provider that we onboard to our network is vetted by us. So we want to make sure that these are trustworthy companies. And especially when it comes to anything that has to do with financials, such as um, payment providers or uh, funding services or FBA acquirers, we don't want to have companies on our website approach approaching the users that use Sermondo, the sellers that use Sermondo to find services when they are not legit and trying to scam money out of them. Because as you know, like the more players there are in the field, the more bad apples are among them. So yeah, we're just uh, in contact with a couple of companies um, trying to see if it makes sense to build partnerships. And if we have a good feeling about them and like all the information they provide is correct, then yeah, we have a good feeling letting them on our platform. So when someone wants to sell their Amazon business and they don't know who they want to sell it to, they can also go to Sermondo, fill in a form, say, um, tell us 
the value of their company and what category they are, et cetera, PP, and then we will put them in touch with the right companies. Well, that's that's fascinating to me because there seems to be a story in a like an about us section of why you guys started this because a vetting process always means that there's some sort of ha thing that happened to either the founders yourself or something like that where they got spurred or hurt by something where there was no processes in place to do that. Therefore, you can find out why you made Ceremundo. Is that is that the case why you guys started the business? Yeah, that's absolutely 100% correct. I mean, I never sold on Amazon and I'm really open about that, but like my business partner, Tobias, who also had the idea for Ceremundo, he was an Amazon seller himself, pretty successful here in Germany. Um, and then he got scammed twice. Um, like, I think the worst one was the fulfillment center who promised him like, yeah, we will store your goods and then deliver within two to three days. So you never run out of stock when eventually that never happened. He ran out of stock, like his ratings went down, like everything, uh, went south. Let's just put it that way. And the problem was he got his recommendation in a Facebook group. Like, I'm not saying that Facebook groups in general are bad. I think it's great to share ideas and to engage with other sellers talking about your issues, but a lot of sellers, especially newbies are not really aware that when they ask for recommendations, like, Hey, does anyone know a great three PL in Germany or freight for water? Um, that a lot of people that are commenting are either like the founders themselves or affiliates of someone. So you don't necessarily get recommendations for a company that fits you and your project and your business best, but just uh, recommendations from people who try to squeeze the money out of you. I agree with that. And I think that's, that's a hard field to navigate too, especially when because I work with affiliates and I work with brand ambassadors. I work with influencers and people you want to trust them. You want to take what they say at face value. But like you said, there's, there's this almost in the last decade, there's been this naturing of falsitivity, if that's a word that I'm uh, making up, um, I don't know, but I just like this false <laughs> nature. Yeah. Just this false nature of making up or just, presenting yourself as a false in a false way whether that's on purpose or not just trying to either coerce people to join because of affiliate commissions or anything like that or there's just another you know they, they have their blinders on and they only want to give like business to another company when that might not be a good fit but ultimately you guys want to make the good fit find a good fit for people who are in you know in need of some sort of business. Is that a better way to put it? Yeah, that's that's like the perfect way to put it. Yes. So so what's the flaw in nature? Is it just the human aspect of it? Where, how do you guys separate the human aspect from businesses? Like what's a what's a trusted company in the eyes of Ceremundo? And how do people not feel like they're gonna get scammed? Is it just length of time of business? Is it quality of work? What what's kind of that, those kinds of thresholds that we can look for? when it comes to not being scammed? Um, so on Sermondo, we work on a review system, but we only publish reviews that are verified because uh, we don't want to be another trust pilot or Yelp or Glass or whatever, uh, where the service providers can just rate themselves and say, oh yeah, we provide a five-star service. So what we do is, I cannot personally work with every single service provider that we have on Sermondo, obviously. Um, but what we are trying to do is reach people that have worked with these companies before, get them to leave reviews on the listings. We also encourage the people who use Sermondo to not only trust us as the only source of um, finding reliable service providers. I mean, all the service providers that are on our side provide the correct information. They have been through a wedding, uh, vetting process, but eventually you also have to take some responsibility and really try to get to know the companies that you're working with. Eventually, a lot of people rush into, um, partnerships with agencies, for example, even though they have never spoken, spoken to them before, like face to face, or at least by video chat or something. They are just relying on what they said in an email. So that way you can never find out if you're a good fit. Like if you 
um, have a certain feel for the other person. That's also very important. It's not only about service quality, but also if you get along pretty well, especially if you want to form like long-term relationships. I mean, if you use a translator one time for one listing, it doesn't matter if you both like football or not. But if you try to work with an agency for like one, two, three years or, or even longer um, or an accountant, bookkeeper, stuff like that, then it should also click like on a personal level. So what I always recommend is get an overview uh, from reliable sources, not necessarily Facebook groups. I mean, if you're in a mastermind with other people and it's a closed group and you know you can trust recommendations, that's also fine. But don't just go to Google because the first 10 results you will see are just the companies being best at SEO, not necessarily the ones that provide the best service. Um, but yeah, go to website. Just, I mean, like Sermondo, it doesn't matter if it's Sermondo or not, but go to a website where you get reliable sources then check their experience, what languages they're speaking, if they have experience with the marketplaces you want to sell in, because let's say you want to sell from the US to Europe and then you get a German agency, but maybe that German agency isn't familiar with the other European marketplaces. But eventually, if you're growing, it makes sense to mm -hmm. also expand to those marketplaces and you don't want to work with like six or seven different agencies. So check their experience. This is something you can do, for example, on Sermondo. We have marketplace experience. You can see it at a glance. So see if they're a good fit for now and the future experience wise, short list like three to five and then hop on a call, like take the time. I know it's, it can be tiring and you, you have to invest maybe a few hours getting to know them, but it's, it's really worth it eventually. Well, like platforms like us, like we, we pride ourselves in making sure that you can speak to multiple marketplaces as you scale and as you grow. So having that all in one, whether it's on Amazon or other e-commerce platforms, that's why it's super important to know that, yes. like you said, not just adding on different services and that can get expensive. People can't rely on that. They don't have a holistic view at that. So that that's, I think that's super important to look at. So what are maybe if I'm, if I'm a new seller, it sounds like this is very much like a new seller or someone who's looking to grow internationally, which is, what, what we look at too, what are some kind of red flags right away? If I'm looking for a partner, are there questions I should ask or there should be red flags that should raise if something happens or you, you hear from them, they say something, something along those lines. What are those things that should instantly raise a red flag for myself? Okay, it's hard to give like a general answer because obviously you ask a sourcing agent and afraid for what are different questions than you would ask a marketing agency. But as a yeah. rule of thumb, you should always be aware of how they answer your questions. So you should come up before an interview, you should come up with a list of things you need to know and you want to know and also... Uh, some things that might not be too comfortable being answered by the service provider and then see how they react to this question. Because if you, they weasel their way around um, the answer and don't give you a clear response, then that's definitely a red flag. It doesn't matter if, which which kind of service provider you are. You're Can you give us a, is there a story that maybe a seller shared with you? Maybe that they they at first they were told this one thing but then they came to you guys they found a vetted and, and a reputable person is there a story that maybe that comes to mind when you talk about that mm, it doesn't matter what category no but it's the it's the other extreme there are two things so first of all uh, if they don't answer your questions like in a clear way and the second is if they promise you the world then it's like <laughs> if it sounds like I, I like to say if it sounds too good to be true then it's because it's too good to be true so we had a lot of um, sellers coming to us after having a bad experience with an, let's say a PPC agency said like, yeah, I will bring your acres down to like 10% within three weeks. And they were like, okay, yeah, it sounds good. But obviously that didn't happen because no one can ever promise how the project will develop. So it's really important that they are realistic. I mean, obviously they try to pitch their services to you, um, but there should be a certain level of transparency and honesty. So this is something that uh, we deal with, I would say, almost on a daily basis or reinstatement services that promise to get your account back. Like there is no promise because they, it's not 
in their hand. I mean, they can try their best, but there's never a hundred percent guarantee. Right. They're selling the promise of trying to get your stuff reinstated and their success rate is much higher than other people's. So that's what they're selling is the higher success rate. And they kind of know how to work hard. And we, we had, you know, Riverbend Consulting, which I know is on our platform. Yeah. Uh, you know, they Shout have, uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I had, uh, yeah, Leslie on the show. So she was talking about, you know, there's just certain things like it doesn't matter how often or how long we have to work on a project. You know, that that's kind of what it is. It's we're telling you we're going to get your account reinstated. It might take us 20 and uh, back and forth with Amazon. It might take us two. You never know going into a fact. And it's it's just that she called it a dark box uh, or a black box, if you will. Yeah. Of Yeah, exactly what they have to go into every single day. So promises that, oh, yeah, it's going to be per trans interaction with Amazon. This is how much we charge you. Well, there's no, you have to think about yourself of how often is that going to happen? In that case, she was, it made sense. Like we're going to take the situation and resolve the situation and it's a flat fee. So that's, that's where my mind as a good service provider makes sense in, in that working on behalf of the seller. And of course they charge a fee, but that's what it is. Um, so interesting. Is there, uh, are there companies that you thought would be, that have, pretty good reputations like uh, are popular around the space that after you guys did a little bit of a deep dive into them, that you were pretty disappointed in their service offerings and what they were, the results they were driving for people. Mm, obviously, obviously I can name anyone. We but, won't name names, know. but is there like, are you, do you like give them a side eye every time you see them if they're still in business? Um, so there was one logistics company. Um, I talked with, uh, Francois and Lisa on their podcast about it. Um, and they were pretty often recommended, especially like in Facebook groups and they had a really good reputation, but, uh, then we got a few reviews for them, verified reviews, because, uh, as I said, like the sellers, um, that rate the service providers have to provide us with some form of proof of cooperation, either like a blackened out service contract or email correspondence so we can see, okay, there has been um, a collaboration. So we got a few of them and we tried to, um, how do you say, like mediate between this company mm -hmm. and the disappointed customers, but there was no response. So eventually we had to take them down, like they're listing down from Sermano. They're no longer with us. And now and, every time. And to yeah. be clear, this is a company that they recommended to Sermano, not, not a uh, Novaland, correct? No, that no, you no. take down. Okay. This is no, something no, that no. They, they were, you were talking about. <laughs> Noviland. Oh, uh, just, that's why I'm clarifying. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Let's call the other company ABC company, like the best. Okay, one. gotcha. I was, so I was making ABC sure we're on the same page. Let's just uh, put it that sure. way. The fantasy name ABC Logistics. So, yeah. uh, and then a few customers um, say like, yeah, they they didn't reply. I don't know where my cargo is, or they were late six weeks. So we reached out to ABC and we're like, hey, we have a few people complaining. Maybe you can sort this out because we don't only see us as like review rating platform, directory matching service, whatever. But we also try to, when there's a problem and we see that someone is leaving a bad review, a lot of times it's just miscommunication. So then, because then they say like, yeah, I can't reach anyone. No one is helping me. So we reach out to them directly and say, hey, can you please help resolve this issue? Because that way it's not like, I'm not happy with the service. I'm just leaving one star and then it's just bad blood on both sides. But then in the best case, eventually they can resolve it and the business um, relationship continues. It sounds like the spiteful seller or the buyer metric of they're not happy. Therefore, they're going to leave a one star review, <laughs> even though there might not be something wrong with the product. Yeah. Amazon might delay it or something out of the seller's hand. So interesting. Is it what, what category is the most difficult to vet in your eyes? uh logistics in general yeah is that is that because the thing in place is time uh allotment and obviously like measurables is when you're delivering you know products yeah. or goods and, and is that the biggest one yeah and logistics i would say is one of the logistics and accounting like oh two of the most complex environments i would say um and it's really hard to get to the people responsible i feel like because when i um when i'm talking with an agency for example it's usually no problem to speak with someone like at the c level but um 
with logistics companies, always another representative. And then you're like, okay, what's the structure of this company? Like, how do you work? And then oftentimes you also get like provided with false, um, uh, what's the name? Um, when an ex customer says something about the service, um, Oh, you're just like a false review or like a, yeah, yeah. like a, like, like a ne negative, yeah, a negative yeah. review, but it's a spiteful review basically. Yeah. And it's just because there are so many scammers in the, especially in logistics, especially like freight forwarding from China. And, um, yeah, so it's, it's a harder job than vetting a good marketing agency in the U S for example. So what is it, is it based upon category? Is it based upon you're seeing it more? region of the world where there's a lot more scammers um that might be in play is it is it is there both, both? okay both, i would say yeah. so what would be if i'm the if i'm a new seller what's kind of my what's the easiest one to kind of vet through is it software is it um you know agency or i you said agencies i feel like that if, when there's people in play i think that that's the the first barrier the first threshold yeah. of who do i have to deal with and are there, those people legitimate software might be in its own little category of how accurate it is is that kind of the basis of what you guys look at yeah and i mean with software you also have always the opportunity or at least almost always the opportunity to test it like in a free trial or whatever mm -hmm. but usually when a when an agency or another service providers where there's like human work involved there's usually no free trial um there's or, typically error when you're working with someone like us especially yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> people like i forgot something or that I, I guess that's a difficult thing to measure is it, it can is that it also maybe an unfair assessment maybe because they might have one bad apple in the bunch and they might just have one bad customer or service rep, but the company is still legit. Is that, is that a fair thing to measure someone's success or rapid, uh, Red Bull nature? No. And especially, I think a lot of Amazon sellers are aware of that, that like one bad review doesn't necessarily speak for your whole, whole product or your whole customer experience that you provide. So, so what, that's why, that's of, why yeah, I say when we get a when we get a bad rating, obviously when it's real, we will publish it. But we also try to get them to get along again, because oftentimes, let's say you're working with an agency and there's a guy named uh, Tom, and you don't like Tom, and Tom doesn't like you, and so you leave a bad review for this agency. But the rest of the team really worked their butts off to help you succeed and maybe get your product launched, whatever. Um, so just because you don't get along with Tom, it doesn't necessarily speak for the whole agency. So yeah, that's why we try to get the conversation starting again. Like, Hey, what's the real issue here? And then maybe he gets a new, you get a new account manager within the agency. And then suddenly it's all sunshine and rainbows. Yeah. Tom sounds like a jerk. He shouldn't have a job yeah, anymore. Yeah. So yeah, we have uh, bad experiences I, with it. I don't, I don't like those times. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, in the other kind of avenue I want to go around, because obviously we're we're trusting nature. We're not all about the negative things in the space. Let's talk about the exciting things in the space growth internationally. Where are you guys as a company seeing the most growth? You're in Germany. I'm expecting Germany to be one of the top places of growth that you're seeing in terms of e-commerce sellers moving overseas from U.S. to Germany. What's kind of your own take on that? Yeah, it's usually um, it's usually either Germany or the UK that sellers start with when they're trying to enter the European markets. Um, yeah, I'm just excited to see. Let's put it that way. I'm excited to see how like Amazon Netherlands and Sweden and Poland will develop within like over the next few months. Um, because when I read it cor correctly, it didn't really take off as much as Amazon was hoping it would. So I don't on know. On the buyer side or seller side? On the buyer side. A lot of sellers hmm. rushed into those markets. I mean, obviously it's the, I would say like low hanging fruit to add to another marketplace. If you're already selling on six European marketplace, it doesn't matter if you have a seventh one or not because the fulfillment network is so good. Um, but buyers wise, I think uh, Amazon didn't have as much of an impact in Sweden as they were hoping to have. 
and the same with uh, the Netherlands. But I'm a big fan of Amazon. Otherwise, I wouldn't work in the in this in this field. I think we um, are. And I think eventually, eventually they will prevail against uh, other marketplaces like Ball.com, and yeah, become the key player in every country. Some to kind of build on that. I've heard there's a lot of data that. <clears throat> backs up Amazon and saying that they're not going to push difficult, like push a lot into trying to be the number one source for purchasing. Um, I think in marketplace pulse, which I love frequenting and I love the data and the analytics that they put together. They said that of all the marketplaces in Europe, Amazon typically hovers around 10% in each country in terms of usability. And that seems extremely low, which it is, but there's just other players that have been established more in the place, uh, CD discount. I mean, every country has their own pretty well-established marketplace um, that just in the United States, we, you know, there's only so many we have like walmart.com and you have direct to consumer sites, of course, Amazon, but in other countries, there's other marketplaces where sellers can buy their goods. Um, you know, Wish is very popular. eBay is very popular, is still around um, and around Europe. So I think Amazon was more of a, we're going to wait and kind of have people adopt their own nature and their logistics system. It, do you think that the hindrance right now is uh, when UK kind of moved away that people, that sellers are just trying to figure out, do I move more of my products in there? Just inventory or availability. Is that maybe an issue that you think that m maybe more people wouldn't look at to enter that marketplace or those marketplaces? We saw a lot of people switching from, having their like base sort of in the UK to Germany after Brexit. So yeah. we got a lot of inquiries for um, storage and fulfillment here in, in Germany. Because a lot of people are moving and shipping more of their goods into Netherlands and the Netherlands also, is fulfilled. Yeah. 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 And I, I think that they became the number one biggest port or one of the areas of import uh one of the biggest ones in in all of europe because europe. Yeah, it used to be it used to be uk and now it's uh netherlands because of their of the uk or excuse me the eu uh connection between all of that what what are the easiest ways that if you're giving advice to sellers what's the easiest places to start growth internationally uh you're recommending these top businesses to start looking to is it localization is it translations what are the the key components that sellers need to have in place that you guys are recommending mm, i think localization really sums it up like you can't expect your products to sell the same way in germany than they do um in the us because the cultures different language obviously it's really important that uh, because let, let's take Germany, for example. When people shop online, they're super alerted every time they see a teeny tiny mistake on a website because they think they're getting scammed. So when they're on an Amazon listing and it's not 100% uh, perfectly translated, then there's no way they're going to buy your products. Or there's also, I don't know how to put it because I also don't want to offend anyone, but the way of advertising is a little bit different in the US. Like I feel like in the US, everything's like extreme and bang, colors. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, I'll go ahead and offend everyone. We like being things big, shiny, and yeah. we have very low <laughs> attention spans, and we'll throw money at whatever <laughs> if it looks uh, colorful. We have we have what's called shiny object syndrome. <laughs> syndrome, And if it looks cool or fascinating, people buy it. And that's why we're the number one e-commerce marketplace in the world. I'm pretty, pretty sure yeah. you can throw a little widget. If it spins or blinks or lights up, we're going to buy it. Um, yeah. I mean, you, you put it, uh, I mean, I didn't say it, you said it, but um, that's true. I'm allowed to say it. I'm from, the you're allowed to say it. Um, <laughs> but here like people in Germany, um, they pay attention to other things. Like they look more into functionality and they do way more research. Also, Fun fact, the return rate in Germany is much higher than in other marketplaces because we're super really? picky. And then also a lot of sellers think, okay, I will enter the EU. So there's a cultural difference between, or let's say Europe, let's don't leave UK out. Okay. Uh, you say, okay. They join. Um, They're on their own. Uh, I'm going to expand to, to Europe. Uh, so there's going to be cultural differences to the US, but also within all the countries like Italy, Spain, Okay, Italy and Spain are somewhat similar, but between 
the British, German, Italian, Spanish, Dutch people. There's so many fine nuances and also super different cultures um, that it's really important to adapt your content, your listings, your advertising to each and every single one. So you couldn't run the same PPC strategy like content-wise in all marketplaces pla and have the same level of success. Absolutely. Yeah, Every well, that's the number one component of localization is no matter who you're talking to, and I, I love going back to this component. We had a professor of local um, uh, e-business, and he calls it e-business because localization is part of that component of it doesn't just talk about the the language. It talks about the the belief system, the religious aspects, the um, what people grow in, what are their values. Um, when we looked at e-commerce websites like IKEA, he said that's the best one he looks at because it not just localizes by country, it localizes by um, re uh, language spe uh, specifically in that region. But then that will go down to like imagery that they use of if it's important for family to be featured, if it's important for uh, men or women or children, who are they talking to? So it really goes deeper than that. And I think that's, like you said, like, this sounds really bad. I think that there's a very broad nature of you can cast a net. And we think we, United States, especially, we take things out like uh, face value. We don't look past behind what what is being presented. We don't think about how they're marketing to us all the time. I say we're getting better at that, but we're used to saying, ooh, celebrity XYZ promotes it, I'm going to purchase it, which is why you see you know, lots of companies invest in money in influencers or celebrity endorsements, things like that. But consumers are getting smarter and they want it to apply to their lifestyle. And as technology becomes more innovative and accommodating to people, companies that speak to that or brands or e-commerce sellers that speak to that, I think will really start to stand out, especially as they grow internationally. So that, that's kind of the key component to really keep in place. Of course, translation is super important, but once you're speaking on a imagery or on a you know content listing, it's very important to make sure that you're speaking to that audience as well. And a good friend of uh, mine here on the show, Emma Tamir from Marketing by Emma, she said, even if you're not marketing or you're not saying something, you're saying something. So even when you're not saying uh, something about your brand, you're saying something about your brand. So uh, everyone has to keep that in mind. It's a, it's not just a pick and choose. You're always representing something with your brand, no matter where in the world you might be. So super interesting. Um, you're saying, let me ask you. And again, if everyone's who watching this online, let me just kind of reset real quick is if you're watching on LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, or Twitter, go ahead and ask your questions about uh, maybe, or have a story about some business that you didn't think that was reputable and you kind of, uh, and you felt that there was a service out there that maybe could have helped you on or someone could guide you along the way. Let me know. Um, or if you, if, if there's any sort of story, let us know. Or if you have questions about it, we can certainly help you all. But of course, you can check us, Hermono. Just go ahead in the comment section. We've linked out already to their website. So check them out for sure. It's free for any seller to check out, correct? So um, definitely a must check out. In that regards, but I guess my question to be, if you could be an expert in one of these fields in Amazon, you said you're not a seller, which uh, field would you be an expert in instantaneously if you could? Photography. Really? Yeah. Why is that? Because uh, I always had a passion for photography and um, I really like what you just said. Like even when you're not really saying something, you're saying something. And I know that the the images of a listing are like the most the single most important thing to catch any user's attention that's uh, why i also love tools like picfu for example and um, where you can really test out like which photos work best um and yeah i just when i'm shopping on amazon i'm i would say 80 percent influenced by the pictures <laughs> So right. if there was one discipline that I would like to master, then it's product photography. And I know uh, I have a lot of our network partners on LinkedIn and they always show like behind the scenes. So when you, especially in the food industry or cosmetics, when you see a great shot, it's insane how much work there is behind it. And I think it's just really fascinating. So yeah, this is something that I would get into if I wasn't working for Samondo, I think. <laughs> 
I think it's very funny that you say that because I am also of a visual graphic design background. Oh, um, really? Yeah, I didn't know. Yes. So I uh, have graphic design uh, in my blood, but I've actually had a professor tell me, you should definitely look at other parts of the world and uh, what you should, uh, this is going to be a passion for you, not a profession. So <laughs> I'll take, I'll take that as a, you're probably right. Uh, I, I'm good at other things. And let's, let's so just say I, that. I, but I, if, I, I did it on the side. Yeah. <laughs> Go if ahead. there's ever a day where I'm starting to sell products on Amazon, I will, I will hire you just oh, because you. I, I trust you. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Well, that, and that's the thing is over time, my, my taste has changed, but the, what they, what they grade you on and, and we're talking about photography and design is design and uh, what looks good is in the eye of the beholder. Right. So that's really hard in my mind to conceptualize of why doesn't it look good to you? But if it looks good to me, like if I put in the work, it can be acceptable in some culture or some, you know, segment of the world. But if it doesn't look good to you, like that, that's, that's completely hard to imagine why that would, you know, make sense in that regards. But it, it does, there's a lot of work to be done and it's more like the layout and the design, but I can see it visually. It's expressing to other people, maybe like what that looks like. And they put it together quicker than I do. I don't know what that, if that <laughs> looks like. So I, I can visualize it and I can talk about it. So yeah. maybe, maybe they're really telling me to go down the path podcasting and partnerships. That's what I excel at. So it is what it is, but, uh, but yeah, graphic design background. I, I see what you're saying. It's interesting to see the behind the scenes, uh, shoots on social media, Instagram, things like that. Um, when you see like the, what, what the end result looks like, but they show you how they made it in the beginning. I, I get drawn in by that kind of stuff because I think the perception and looking at the eyes of what the ultimate customer is going to be looking at and how they achieve that is so fascinating. And I think that's part of being a seller online is what do you want this product to achieve? Uh, solving a solution, have it giving a sort of feeling and how do you achieve that by definition of marketing definition of like product photography, uh, your box, just how you describe your, you know, product. Is that, do you think just, is that the thing that's changed the most over time as e-commerce has developed is we're more visual creatures instead of reading a listing throughout, like dimensions and if it fits a space we don't really yeah. care as long as it looks cool yeah yeah definitely because i think the attention span is so short not only in the us but like worldwide in every country um and i think everyone can relate that when you're clicking through either an online shop ebay walmart amazon like you will instantly devote more time to the to the listings where the images really catch your attention um, and I think that has gotten even worse or better. I don't know how to put it, um, over the last years, because there is just so much, um, so much offering so many different products, so many different brands. Like it's, we have so much to choose from. So you got to start somewhere. And I think we all, I talked with Anthony from Pikfu about this. Like, I think we all have like this automatic filter in our brain that instantly says without you even realizing like nope 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 just because you don't like the picture or it's just not as appealing to you as another one and then you shortlist automatically from 20 listings maybe three or four then you read the title and say like okay does it have like the most important features that i'm looking for in this product let's say bluetooth speakers are there uh, are there ones that are waterproof if that's super important to me, it should be in the title. And then I shortlist again, like two of them, two of the four I shortlist before. And then, then is only the time when you start like reading bullet points and really devoting time to this listing. But yeah, the attention span, like in the first, I call it like the first stage is. It's an, unco it's an unconscious biases of yeah. we subconsciously and that. And that's why a lot of, I was looking at the, subconscious nature of social media. And I was watching this video uh, last night, actually, and we were talking about the nature of which content gets delivered to a consumer. And this is just on all social platforms of where content lives and how to get there. And things like TikTok, where, for example, it's what's being delivered to you. You have no, you have no choice, but just going through the feed and swiping nature. Like it's either catches your attention right away and you swipe up. So that's where a lot of new, 
people are literally being trained how to access new information and new content by just swiping. And that's how it's being delivered to it. Now, Facebook, it was always like a scroll feature, like it's still scrolling, but you would have to read content or you would have to go through to different tabs and have to search for it. It's now being delivered to you in even a, I'll call it a dumber nature where we just literally yeah. swipe through it and have limited the amount of the capability of spending time searching through a platform to find content. And that's why more, more people are spending time on that platform. So that being said, tying this all back to uh, e-commerce, if you can capture people's attention quicker, go through their imaging looks really great, stands out the most, and then they can sort it and limit their, their time on other people's listings. You've instantly won that person's mentality that buy, if you will, subconsciously. Yeah. So I think it's super fascinating. And also shout out to PicFu for their, their new website redesign and launch oh, yeah. shout out. I want to give them, uh, if they're listening to this, uh, Anthony and Justin and, um, those guys over there, they're doing fantastic stuff. So shout out to them. They, I know they, I got that notification here last week. So congrats to them. Um, what, uh, Chris said, what will people look back in maybe 50 years and kind of be shocked by or appalled by in what's going on right now in the Amazon or e-commerce space? Do you think? Mm, okay, let's just hope it will be like this that in 50 years, people can't believe how bad seller support was back in 2021. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I, I, I can really see hope that. that will be the case, and that we are not sitting there in fifty years like, damn, it's still the same. I can't reach anyone. No one can help me from Amazon. Um, yeah, and I hope that more and more people come to the conclusion that it's sometimes worth investing in a service rather than doing something yourself. Um, let's keep the photography or just like listing creation in general, if you're a creative person yourself and you're successful in creating and designing listings, which are a few sellers and fine, maybe you can do it yourself. But I really hope that over the next years that, that there will be more a mentality of, I don't have the cost of a photographer, I have the cost of a listing optimization service, but it's more seen as an investment and so I really those are the keywords to use. Yeah. Investments have costs. Cost yeah. is a negative connotation. Yeah. Investment is you're putting effort into something that's going to yield so results. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I really hope you, is there an industry that you think that people don't invest in enough? Is it, is it photography that you think, or is there other parts of the components of e-commerce? Uh, I, I would almost venture to say like, it's almost tied. Like I would say photography and maybe logistics. I would say that those are the two that people don't invest enough time, resources, energy, energy, or uh, just education in general. Is there other places that you think that people are not spending enough time? Um, you could ask Jana. I think a lot of people also don't invest enough time in like translating their listings correctly. I'm sure. So <laughs> I would say listing, listing optimization in general, because a lot of people think like, I mean, they can do it themselves. There's no one stopping, stopping them from doing them, uh, from doing that. But so many people just want to save like every, every cent they have, maybe to put it in their PPC campaigns or whatever. Um, but like your, your listing will not convert if it looks shitty. It doesn't matter if you have 10,000 a month for your PPC campaigns. So I think there's a long thought process to go. Um, so yeah, sometimes it's worth, even when it seems much like spending five, $600 on product photos or translating your listings, um, having your listings translated by a professional, but eventually it's an investment. You do it to grow your business. Um, it's good for conversion. It will be good for your reviews. Like I really hope that people start seeing the bigger picture sooner in their seller journey. Yeah, I would put it that way. And if you're looking for extra capital and you're selling internationally, there's a good solution out there. I've heard called ping pong that can put money to your <laughs> to invest in things like that. Also, so, also, yeah, yeah exactly. I think a lot of people are still hesitant about like, getting funding because they're scared of, I don't know, going into debt, but there are so many great solutions like ping pong nowadays. Um, that, and I mean, you can't grow without putting in capital. And if you don't have the capital yourself, you have to get it somewhere else. And there are yeah. services for that for good reason. 
Absolutely. I mean, there's fantastic services for investment into your yourself or your products. Obviously, I think the number one component of sellers where most of their money goes is in your inventory. And if it's just sitting there on the water, like it might be here in uh, uh, Newport Beach or uh, uh, here off the coast of the West Coast of the United States, or if it's just sitting there or your Amazon's told you you have way too much inventory and you have to figure out what to do. That's where a lot of people's money is and they have to spend it. So it's important to either, if you need more products, to go to the services uh, where they can get money up front and invest in that, or you find services that can help just the income of on different marketplaces, convert it. When you're converted over, you want to make sure that you're saving every dollar you can. And that's the most important thing. I think it's fascinating. Uh, people don't understand that when current, especially internationally, we were talking about the earlier, sellers don't understand that there is this component of different value in different countries around the world. Like a dollar means something stronger in different countries, but it can be weaker in other components of the world. And they don't understand that they're like, I thought I was getting this much. And when I converted it back to the dollar, I didn't expect, like I wasn't getting as much. And I said, A, those fees, but also B, the dollar in the, the Japanese yen or something like that, the yen to the dollar. I don't know what it currently stands out, but it could be weaker or it could be stronger. So yeah. people don't think about those components of the, the subtle nature of internationally, whether you said like logistics, it could be costing money if it doesn't get to you on time or translations, you offend somebody if it doesn't uh, translate correctly or if it doesn't speak in localized way. Um, but then also money, that, that's, a, that's an international uh, language. People understand if you're not getting as much as you thought. That yeah, people I think freak themselves like a, out. a funny thing to observe. I mean, it's not funny, obviously, but that so many people don't want to invest in certain services because they say, oh, I don't have that much of a budget or it costs too much. But then when it comes to like choosing a good payment provider when they're doing business overseas or getting funding or taking care of their reimbursements, they're, they're just not doing it. Like they're, they're not doing any research and they're just, there's just their money that's being left on the street that they could use to invest in exactly the services they are now saying are too expensive, like they can afford it. But if they would like, do a little more research and pick a payment provider, a good one that gives you good conversion rates and also doesn't rip you off with like 10% fees or that you hire a good reimbursement service so you get the money back from Amazon that you deserve. So many sellers are not even thinking about that, which I think is a, is a weird thing. It's your money, so. Well, I think a lot of people take it at face value, right? Because you Amazon, Amazon gives you and enables sellers to do all this through their own ecosystem, but they're going to charge you an arm and a leg for it. And that yeah. shouldn't surprise anyone The the fees that they charge for this kinds of services with convenience comes cost, but you put in the extra effort. This is why I think that there's not as many people that when they get into this industry, they say, Oh, it's too hard to do. I'm not going to do it. They think that the barrier is too hard. They don't want to overcome it or problem solve. Now that can be done with more capital or that can be done with more time and effort and energy. And that's why I think it's important with services like both of ours that, educate people and say, listen, there's ways around what your problem is. You're just not looking hard enough or you're relying on the wrong resources to help you guide you through this barrier or over this barrier around it. Uh, finding reputable companies like what you guys do, saving money on transactions, such as receiving your payments every two weeks from Amazon. Those things are all possible, but people just think, this is what it is cost the cost of doing business is. Yeah. And they're just taking a face value. Don't go down that rabbit hole. They're like, I'm just going to worry about my product and the keyword research. Those are all important, but to be successful down the road so that you can continue on this path. This is where, this is where the, the actual work needs to happen. So yeah. that being said, uh, is there any other, like with, I know, I'll, and I was been highlighting this ever since it was announced. We have prime day coming up. Uh, on June 21st and 22nd, that's still happening in Germany at the same time, correct? Yes. What What are you guys uh, expecting in terms of, this was quickly announced, it's only a few weeks away with, you had mentioned earlier in the show about uh, inventory restrictions. What is the expectation from your side of things for Prime Day? Are we going to see it be successful? Are we going to see it be limited because of all that? What's kind of the expectation from Ceremondo or yourself? <sighs> I mean, I would have to guess like completely into the blue, but I think it's going to be pretty successful, even though they didn't 
take that much time to promote it as like maybe not last year but the years before um i still think like european sellers usually wait with a lot of their purchases until prime day arrives because they know they can get get good deals so i think it's going to be pretty successful we also have seen fortunately that a lot of sellers took action right away when the date was announced um like now it could be i would try too many new things for example with your ppc campaigns like now but you can still make a few adjustments maybe to your listings right if you they should have already been doing that yeah they should have implemented that earlier yeah. on but yeah they if you're, yeah, if you're not acting definitely. now start now and make sure that you're starting to ramp up those campaigns uh for optimization but yeah i think it's interesting there's been a couple of things that have, have piqued my mind when people have talked about this one is this is going internationally but because of the storage limits it's fascinating that the timing matches up with around what the inventory limit restrictions have pretty similarly but there's a rumor that they might do a second one before you went q4 oh. which then i mean that's just a rumor again it, it's possibility mm -hmm. i don't know how reputable it is but i've heard a lot of buzz around there might be a second one before q4 which would be also very fascinating on top of the inventory restrictions so that be that being said, I think it's just a very difficult field to navigate right now, especially with your inventory in general, people trying to get inventory into Amazon and figure out the logistics chain of if I run out, am I going to have a warehouse? I can just get it there and time it out. There's There needs to be innovation in that space. And hopefully uh, this is going to be something that sellers can all find out or figure out, obviously with help of Sermundo, like what, what's a trusted like 3PL and uh, people with warehousing and things like that. Uh, what's kind of the future for you guys the rest of uh, 2021? Uh, I know it's like the middle of the summer uh, already right now here. What's kind of that focus for you guys that you, that's going to be worked on uh, moving forward? Is it the aggregator space that that's going to be the biggest component of what you're working on? Um, I think we're actually going to focus a little bit more on full service admins and agencies the, le the next few months because we want want to try a few things and want to establish like even closer relationships um but yeah also we're looking to expand the acquirer side uh on our platform because we just know that there's such a high demand and um i think it's besides threads you and maybe elevate uh super hard to find good names where you can sell your amazon business to but there are more than these two um, great companies. And yeah, that's why we're trying to build like a microcosmos there on Sermondo for this not so niche anymore topic. Yeah, it's been about almost two years now that everyone's kind of surprised, not surprised, but now learning about I can exit my asset. My asset is my brand. I can now exit it and get a nice little payday. Um, circling back to that, Perch was $775 million that raised in their latest <laughs> round. So it is officially the largest in the space. In, in yeah, now uh, they have raised in one round more than any other aggregator out there. This one just happened to be a little bit more than Thrasio's initial big uh, raising, yeah. which is which I, I understand that whole number game. But again, for everyone who's listening to this, that's to debt. That's to debt. Um, towards acquiring businesses that's not all equity so it doesn't mean that they're investing in the actual business themselves it's to acquire brands and that that's a topic that we i love talking about as well so uh past episodes of crossover commerce we've talked about that and acquiring businesses and what that looks like moving forward do you think that there's going to be a i guess my final question for you christina is what's the kind of prediction you think do you think there's gonna be a lot that fail and just don't succeed and get gobbled up by bigger ones um, well, it's kind of the prediction since you there's the so many, the acquisition yeah. And the acquisition space, is there going to yeah. be, uh, all, I there's think a lot it's of, a huge, yeah. I think it's a huge shark tank and a lot of the new players will not survive. They will either like go down or being like captured by the bigger sharks such, such as Thrasio. Um, so I think eventually there will be a few big players, but not too many smaller ones because it just um, demands so much capital to run such a business. And I think maybe investments will then more go towards the big fish. 
Yep. And, and that I think that's what a lot of people also see as well. Very much, very much so. So um, that being said, um, I'm going to go ahead and wrap up this episode, if that's okay with you. What, where can people learn about Zermundo? Where can people reach out and connect with you? What's the best way to do that in that regard? Um, yeah, obviously, you can just visit Zermundo.com. It's free to use for every seller. We also have a personalized matching service. So if you're looking for any kind of service, you can just fill out a short form telling us what you need. And then we or I <laughs> look manually for a good match for your inquiry. Um, we also have a YouTube channel with our own um, podcast and we do publish a lot of educational content, especially on expansion topics on our blog. Um, if you would like to connect with me personally, the best way to do it is Instagram or LinkedIn. And um, yeah. I guess that's it. You can also shoot an email to Christina at Zermondo.com. Yeah, there are like a hundred different all ways. ways to all the different ways. Yeah, you're you're all over <laughs> the place. You'll find a way. Great. If you want to reach me, you will find a way. <laughs> Write a hand handwritten letter to Christina, everyone, and we'll make sure that somewhere in Germany she'll receive it. Just send it to Germany. Yeah, I'm sure yeah. she'll find it. So no, I'm yeah. just kidding. <laughs> but anyways, uh, hey, thanks for hopping on today. It was a lot of fun. Um uh, make sure everyone that can check out Saramundo, it's there in the comment section as well as the show notes. So check that out if you're looking for reputable companies. Uh, we'll have you back on again as a friend of the show. Thanks so much for hopping on Crossover Commerce. Thank you, Ryan, for the invitation. I really enjoyed this. Yeah, no problem. And again, everyone, thank you so much for hopping on again. This was episode 115 of Crossover Commerce. Uh, don't get scammed by, you know, don't get scammed. Work with the right e-commerce companies, go ahead and check out companies that are listed with Saramundo. Their job is their reputation of those other businesses. They're going to vet that, make sure that you're working with the right kinds of businesses that are going to be on the best. They're looking out for the consumer or the seller, I should say. So make sure that you check those out there. And if you're a business listening to this, go ahead and check them out as well. If you want to list with Saramundo, always important to make sure that your business is offered in all the locations in the world. But Great stuff that they're doing over there. Great content as always, especially growth internationally. As always, that is what we love talking about here on Crossover Commerce with Ping Pong Payments. So again, this week we have one more episode. We're going to be hopping on tomorrow with Seller App um, with uh, Ram. He is, we're going to talk about David Driven using BPO reports to open new sales opportunities. Super excited about that. They're um, about what their growth opportunity is in India, but also in the United States that focus as well. Kind of a, a more, for those who are more data nerds like myself, I'm really excited to kind of hop in and kind of learn from him in that capacity as well. But this is your first or 115th time on Crossover Commerce. Thanks for listening the whole time and tuning in. We appreciate you always stopping by. We'll go live about, we go live about three to five times per week in order to bring the best and brightest in the Amazon e-commerce space. That being said, thanks for tuning into this episode. I'll go ahead and catch you guys next time on Crossover Commerce. Take care, everyone.